So this week is really where we're going to start focusing on um, pictorials. So building these large kind of um, vector space models, and then we'll do topics models, and then I don't have the next week after that on my calendar, but I think it's multidimensional scaling. So we've kind of been working on grouping, um, creating categories of objects with, uh, you know, log regression, you're trying to predict groups. With clustering, you're trying to create groups. Um, with conditional inference trees, we're trying to break it down by group and show the, 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 the split. And now we're really going to move more into like bigger, less kind of grouping together and more of pictures of the data. Um, and a lot of this has been leading to these two weeks. Uh, easily my favorite two topics. Also, I think last week someone asked me about uh, final projects. This makes a really great final project. It's really interesting. Um, or next, the next lecture as well. Okay. So what we're going to talk about is semantic vector space, the idea of global distributed, distributed models. So if you really like this stuff, there's a really great chapter by Mike Jones. I actually might have made it, yeah, I made it um, part of the reading for this week. And he talks a lot about uh, what these models are and how they look and like shows you some cool pictures. Uh, there's a couple more. He's written like four or five book chapters for a while. He was just, that's all he did. Um, and that really explain these models, the purpose of these models and their names. I'm going to globally call these semantic vector space models. They have lots of different names, though. Distributed models, connectionist models, like um, calling it a semantic vector space is just kind of the gener most general term we can use to cover a, a wide variety of different model types. So what is a semantic vector space? Uh, what are distributional models overall? And then how do we build one of these? And very specifically this week, we're going to focus on LSA, latent semantic analysis. Make sure that's off. My mother is texting me about cabinets right now. So for everyone who has um, moms that are remodeling their house, I feel you right now. <clears throat> so very specifically, we're going to focus on latent semantic analysis. Um, as one of the most enduring and most popular models, uh, certainly not the newest model. They've been around since the 90s, as far as I'm aware, but one of the most well used and well suited to a lot of the things that you guys are probably interested in if you have lots of text. And so I think for biz business people for a while didn't really catch on to these, but I think as text analysis became more prominent, because of comments on websites or um, reviews or whatever, these became more useful. Okay. Uh, and we'll talk about their limitations as well. Okay. LSA is one of my favorite topics, uh, and so I'm going to be very animated. <laughs> so what is a semantic vector space? Okay. It's a really popular term to kind of give distributional models um, that give them, I guess, a little bit more of their flavor because they tend to be about semanticity, right? Meaning we're building up a theme, a picture of the data. Um, and then mathematically, they do work on vectors, right? So columns of data. Um, but they've also been called distributional models because they're talking about the distribution of words in a text. And I'm not talking about like where the word is. That's more um, lexical dispersion. This is the distribution of words across many documents um, in, in many contexts, and so words that keep the same company, that are in the same context, um, have similar meanings. Sometimes these are called the bag of words models. There are hybrid models uh, that don't quite work as much as a bag of words. The idea behind a bag, of, oops, sorry, behind a bag of words model is that we take all the words in the text and we throw them into a bag and we just <laughs> jumble them up and um, what we're left with is just the words, a frequency count of each word. And so we've lost context. So one of the big limitations of distributional models is they are context-free. Okay. Um, they keep context within a document in the sense that words are frequent in the same document, but they don't keep the context of the words around them. Okay. 
Okay, so these are unigram models, generally, um, where we're looking at the frequency of each word in each document. When I say document, I can mean any type of text. It could be each individual movie review, it could be each tweet. All this does not work very well in such small samples. Um, so if you like Twitter analyses, you can do LSAs on them, but it works better if you uh, treat users as a semantic space or treat periods of time. You kind of clump together larger pieces of text. Um, for these to work well, they need friends or more words in a document rather than less. Okay. Um, I don't know that I've seen a lot of work on how useful they are with smaller text numbers of words, but for my own personal work, I know it doesn't work. <laughs> so larger individual documents are better um, because they are about the distribution. And so if there's no words, you can't really have a distribution. Okay. Um, and so bag of words because we don't hang on to context. There are some hybrid models that do hang on to context um, a little better that work about the same. Personally, they'll argue for all day for their model being best. I have a conference that I go to in November where I get to see all these people and listen to them argue about why their model's best. Um, but practically, I think each one has its one shining spot, and the best models are actually hybrids of a lot of these. But there's a but there, and we'll get to the but later. Uh, the, the main idea behind them, the kind of the theory, is we learn language from repeated experience. Right? As humans, um, we need that input into the system. We're statistical language processors right from the beginning of the semester. Um, and so we learn uh, language and its grammar and all these other things through um, frequency. Remember, if you don't know the answer, the answer is frequency. And therefore, we can build language models and represent a text, a discourse, language, right, um, by taking lots of text in a corpus and essentially mimicking what people do when they're getting lots of text. Okay. So we, um, we learn through lots of input, and if we give a model lots of input, we can suggest that the information we get back from it is the way uh, language works in people. Okay. <clears throat> and so I've used this quote multiple times, but it's just such a great one. You know a word by the company it keeps. Okay. And that's what we've done all semester. Collocates, distinctive collexeme analysis. Um, really, you could apply that to log and to, de and to inference trees and clustering, but all of the models from here until the end of the semester really rely on this fact. Okay. Words that are the same have the same friends. Okay. So that they keep the same company. So most popular model we're going to do today is LSA, so latent semantic analysis. Okay. It is not actually originally Landauer and Dume, um, but was popularized by their um, solution to Plato's problem article. So there are citations for LSA before this, or about the 1990s. Um, but if you are talking about LSA, you're generally talking about the flavor of LSA that's Landauer today. Okay. Um, it is definitely the most famous of these models. Uh, I would say it's being overrun now by these ideas of deep neural nets. But those deep neural nets had their roots in this idea. Okay. Um, and just like with machine learning, I, I have this feeling that sometimes more complex models don't really give us a better answer than some of these simpler procedures. Um, but, you know, people can argue about this. Um, but definitely one of the most popular, so it's an easy one to learn. I had someone tell me recently that no one ever used this anymore, and so I... <laughs> Like pulled out Google Scholar and was like, yeah, sure. That's why it's been cited like 20,000 times in the last 20 years. But okay, um, it is very famous. When, it, when you're talking about academics being famous, right? 
Um, so what can we do with an LSA model? Once we build a uh, LSA semantic space, we could use it to calculate semantic similarity through cosine. Uh, the models have been used to do word categorization, so grouping together similar words. Uh, talking about text comprehension, which we'll also do with text coherence, and most famous essay scoring. So for a while it was used as a way to score essays for things like the GR, not the GRE, that doesn't have typing. Um, yeah, it does. Uh, the GRE, which has a written component, the SAT, things that have those essays attached to them that ETS, the testing company, puts out. Um, it also is very famous for being able to answer questions correctly on the TOEFL, okay, so the English fluency test. Okay. Um, the criticisms of LSA is that it completely ignores word order, okay. and this is a criticism of all distributional models because none of them do word order. Okay. And so the criticism of um, of hybrid models is that they rely uh, there when they add word order it becomes you need an exponential amount of text for this to work um, and so then the criticism of LSA is that it doesn't include word order so they're kind of opposites of each other. It doesn't really posit exactly what's happening in the brain although I don't know that it was ever meant to and to me the big hang up here is it's a, not an incrementally learning model. So it's not as if you can have the model, get new data, and just update the model. You essentially just wipe it and start over. So there's no incremental learning in these types of models. You build them, and there they are. Um, and we know that humans do do incremental learning. The second my fan went off, and it's like 1,000 degrees today. It's all that excited breathing that I'm doing, right? <clears throat> all right? Some other pretty famous cases of um, distributional models includes HAL, and this is a joke on 2001, uh, A Space Odyssey. So Burgess and Lund is kind of the original citation for this. Um, Kurt Burgess still does a ton of cool stuff with HAL, and it's it is the opposite of LSA in the sense that it does have a moving window. So it's still a bag of words, but those words are weighted by the window that they're in, meaning um, each like six word chunk is more strongly connected to the words inside its chunk than words outside its chunk. But if the words share the same chunks, meaning uh, I own a cat, and I own a dog, and the only word I've changed here is the animal, the cat and dog will still come up as really popular, even though they weren't in the same window, because they share similar windows. Okay, so they look the same. And so this does include that gradual learning. And so it scans the document as if it's actually reading, and uh, updates the model as new pieces come in. So this model does do incremental work. Um, it's been used to solve that semantic task performance, so things like a dog is a, is a, is a tree, and you would say no. Um, so problem-solving tasks, it does calculate similarity if you want, and has been used to predict priming, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. Okay. Very popular. And then there's a new version where, what was he doing in the class conference? Where he was talking about how they used it to um, read in uh, entries, diary entries of people with cancer, and they were able to predict like if people were getting better or not with it. Like They've done some pretty amazing um, things with HAL. Okay. Uh, a similar model to HAL developed at the same time as Coles, which is correlated occurrence analog to lexical semantics. One thing you should notice is that uh, semantic researchers really love their acronyms. So almost all these models have cute acronyms. Um, Coles works almost the same as HAL. It has a slightly different version of the math. Um, a quick comparison between the two, because for a long time this was the battle of the vector space models. Um, 
in an LSA model, words are similar if they have the same context, meaning they appear in the same in the documents at the same rate as its other word appears in the same documents. So the words that appear with cat are the same words that are going to appear with dog usually. How is words are similar if they appear in the same positions in a text? Similar idea, different focus. Um, <clears throat> Some other models, my favorite being Beagle, told you cute acronyms, right? Bound encoding of aggregate language environment. I really want to know who, how long Mike Jones, the guy, the article that for today, I really want to know how long it took him to come up with this. And every time I see him, I mean to ask, and then I get distracted by talking about something else. Um, but this is a very popular newer model. And at the last conference, I talked to them, and they were working on developing this in Python because the model is written in Fortran, <laughs> which is kind of a disaster. Um, and so I'm hoping once they finish that, we can port it into R, and we can, I can start teasing you some of these newer things, too. Um, the nice thing about the two models we're going to cover is they have really great packages already built for, for R. Okay. Other ones, temporal context model. Uh, the difference in these is that they're random vector models. So what it does is it combines the approach of an LSA bag of words and a how moving window and then also adds in the fact that language is very creative and flexible so it has kind of a random start and like some words just happen to be related purely by chance um, so it kind of is trying to mimic how people process these sorts of things as well as just simply building a model um, so one of the newer models, one of the better combinations of these types of models. Then a completely different set of models um, called Topics. Um, up to this point, LSA, HAL, Beagle, Coles, TCM, I think I've got them all, all have a very similar mathematical underlying. Topics is pretty different. Okay. So we'll talk about Griffith's Topics models in the next lecture. So how do I build one of these things? Okay, we're going to talk about how does one pre-process a text document. Okay, we have done none of this so far. All, everything has been nice, pretty clean documents or data frames for you to work with. Now, how do I deal with the mess that is normal text? Okay, I'll talk about how you can clean up documents. There's multiple ways to do this. So uh, I'm going to show you actually a couple. Uh, my two favorite, anyway. Uh, we're going to talk about how to calculate coherence. Okay, coherence is similar kind of to essay scoring. I'll tell you how I used to use this in my class. And then we'll end with how do you create your own space. Okay. Within those spaces, we can examine their neighborhoods. Okay, so we're basically building a neighborhood of, of a town, and we can explore each little neighborhood with it. All right, so the way LSA works, without getting too crazy into the math, because, you know, there's other classes that cover more of this stuff, but um, the first thing that happens is you're going to create a term, and this is called a TDM. You'll see this as, if you use the TM, text matrix, Patrick, package any, TDM is a pretty popular phrase. Um, a term. So anytime you see the word term, we're talking about one, first it's rows in a data frame, uh, and those are the individual words. Okay. So we've got words by document matrix. Okay. This is simply a uh, conditional frequency distribution where you uh, just count how many times each word appears in each document. Okay. Easy enough. That matrix is then manipulated to hell and back, personally. Okay. So it's going to be processed uh, by weighting, and we'll talk about why is weighting important in a minute. Then singular value decomposition. This is a special type of, uh, of math, which allows us to kind of reduce said matrix. Okay. Um, 
And what it actually returns, it, it can reduce rows actually by dropping unimportant words, but it actually tends to, in very large document sets, reduce documents. So what the SVD does is it takes the whole matrix and kind of compresses. So you lose some of the, the words or the terms that are so infrequent that they don't matter, or their contexts are weird, or essentially they're zero. But you'll also lose documents where it kind of crunches them down. So it almost, in a sense, returns um, themes at that point, where each column is kind of a thematic context. Uh, the models we're going to work with are small enough where we keep all of the documents separate. So it kind of depends on goal, researcher goal there. Um, but there has been some work on how many columns do you need to accurately represent the documents. And the answer is only about 300. Okay. After that, the, the, the usefulness of it is lost. Like There's no extra information added. But you can work with much smaller amounts of documents. It's just better if you have more words in each document. Then what we can do is take that and use it to calculate coherence, cosine, and neighborhoods. All right. So kind of a picture of what's going on. So let's say we have each of these documents are just text files. And each column represents a document. Each row here is a word in the document. So in this picture, what we would find once we were done running all of the math here is that document one and document four are very similar because they use the same word sets. So complexity, algorithm, and entropy in this example would be very similar words because they keep the same company. They're in the same documents and they appear together. And then complexity and algorithm are going to be even higher because they've got an extra document. These are going to be very different from traffic and network, which are clearly two, um, are in a separate set of documents. If we had a ton of documents and we were squunched the matrix down, what we would end up having is a document set that represented complexity, algorithm, and entropy, and a separate set that represents traffic and network. So the goal here is to recognize these patterns of word co-occurrence. Um, but notice how many empty spaces there are. And so this is one issue that we have with these kinds of models, um, the sparsity of the matrix. And so what I mean by that, since that slide's like 10 slides from now, is that um, there are going to be a lot of zeros. Because if you think about taking every word from every document and listing it out, um, each column is going to have a lot of empty rows because they just don't have those words in that document. Um, so a sparse matrix sometimes is difficult to work with. So when we build our own, we will control for that sparsity by using a weighting scheme. That is a simple explanation of what's going on. Let's walk through the process of using one of these. And I want to make a clear distinction between using a pre-built space and building your own space. So we'll get there, get there in a minute. So what we're going to do is take, and you could do this on any text. The assignment has you do this on um, books. But this could be any text. Somebody for their final project did this on um, uh, some MBA entrance exams kind of text. This, this could work on anything that is text. Um, and this could be in any language. So the, the beautiful thing about LSA is that as long as the word forms are consistent, meaning it's all the same language, um, it doesn't matter if this is English or um, or Spanish or Chinese or whatever because the symbols just have to mean represent something. Okay. That's actually true of I think everything that we've kind of done so far but this is really important here where it does not literally matter what symbols you input as long as they have meaning and they are consistent meaning you're not mixing languages. Okay. All right anyways 
what we're going to look at today is a list of answers to an exam question that I gave students uh, when I was teaching a cognitive psychology class. So I taught a very similar course at my old job where we were talking about psycholinguistics and computational linguistics and natural language processing from a psychology perspective that we never did in encoding. It was more just concepts. Um, and so on one of those days, one of their exams was over attention. So attention is a really important cognitive concept where you are talking about being able to focus on some things and tune other things out. And um, we spent several weeks talking about this concept and then I gave them a, a test. And the test asks them to define attention and relate it to several other things that we had talked about in that lecture set. Okay. Um, so this is an essay answer, which is a perfect example of LSA given that it um, really shines at scoring essays. And here's an example of uh, answer number one. This student did not do very well because um, the, the, this is an essay question, so it's supposed to be almost a page long, and they wrote one sentence. Okay. And we'll talk about why this is problematic for um, using these in these models as well. Okay. Then student two wrote a lot more. Okay. So that's the data. Let's see what we can do with it. Okay. So we're going to pre-process some of this data. This step right now is going to keep the structure of the data. This does not reduce to a bag of words problem just yet. And um, it's going to keep some of the things that you would normally do for a text piece. Because what we're going to do is just process this to use with a pre-built space. Okay. So you can download LSA spaces that people have already coded. Um, which is part of the lecture today, and then you can compare them to documents you have. Okay. This is kind of how essay scoring works. Um, but if you're going to do that, you do not pre-process the data as much as you do if you are building a space. Okay. So we're actually going to do data processing twice in two different ways, and um, I've got my favorite way that I do it for each one of those. So the Ngram library, uh, you could also use the, the tidy text library. I haven't played with this very much, but I think it also does some really, some really good stuff. I just kind of already know Ngram, but more ways to know how to do things never hurts. Okay. Um, here is the preprocess function. I have this all commented out just so you can see what it does. Uh, and then what we're going to do is use it as in the apply function. Okay. So what happens is preprocess this is an ngram library, you put in a single string. So you can't use this on an entire vector of data. You have to use one string at a time. The default is to lowercase everything. That's a good idea. Most models are already lowercased. We don't want to remove punctuation. This is the default um, because to calculate coherence or for score it for an essay scoring type type deal, um, you need punctuation. You need sentences. So we're going to leave in punctuation. We're going to leave in numbers. Okay, often people take them out, but in this scenario, the numbers don't hurt anything. Fixed spacing just deletes all the weird tabs, double spaces. It essentially puts a white space between everything leaving the punctuation wherever it is. So the defaults on preprocess are actually what we want. Okay. But if you use this function again in a different way, you might want to change some of the defaults, which you can do by sticking them here at the end of apply. So I could do preprocess comma remove dot punct equals true. So I can actually just kind of like slap it into the end of this here, right here. Right now, I'm not going to do that, though. So I'm going to save this as just a separate column where it shows me the original answer and then the processed answer. I'm going to uh, up, use apply. 
uh, on my exam answers data frame. Do that across rows, so one for rows, and just process it. And I think it helps here. I don't have a picture totally how this works. Let me hit this button and this button. So let's look at the exam answers. So you can kind of see what happened. So here's the original. Attention is what we choose to focus. It's lowercase them and um, doo -doo -doo -doo, uh, fixed all the spacing. Okay. So I would consider this a pretty light pre-processing. All we've really done is kind of normalize the case and the spacing. We'll do some more compli not complicated, more more, more, more. I don't have a good word here. Uh, some heavier pre-processing later. Uh, Alright, so what I'm going to do is load a space. Okay. This is pre-built. I haven't built it myself. We'll get to building them in a minute. Okay. So when you load one of these, they're actually a special type of matrix in R. Um, you can't really totally view them. You can kind of view them, as you can see here. I wouldn't use the view function because your, <laughs> your system will lock up if it's anything like mine. Um, essentially, depending on how big this space is, you may not be able to, to, like, to look at it. But you can always print the first couple of rows or the first couple of columns. And I'm using the LSA Fun Library. This is a separate library from the LSA package. package. Um, what it does is it has some extra functionality added to it. So that's what the fun stands for. And then I told it to not tell me all of the nonsense. It's like when you load ggplot now and it gives you like 800 lines of stuff. Like be quiet, basically. Um, so what it has is this has been processed. So it has the, the words by um, a context or a theme here. In this particular example, this is by chapter. And you'll notice it's called Wonderland. This is Alice in Wonderland run through an LSA space um, by chapter. Okay. It has way more rows and columns, uh, but here's the first four or five. Now, the numbers here aren't going to make a whole lot of sense until we talk about how to create a space. Uh, but these are weighted uh, relationships to their document. Okay, or to their context. Um, and then the negative ones mean here that you would not see that word in this context. Positive would mean that you would see that word in this context. Okay. Numbers are usually very small for reasons we'll get to in a little bit. Um, the LSA Fun package has several pre-built spaces that are downloaded that are in the package, like Wonderland. And then they have several spaces that are downloadable from the internet. Uh, I've got another one that I've downloaded from them already. Uh, that's the English, essentially all of English combined into one. Or we could build our own using LS, the LSA package. Uh, at the end of this lecture, the word LSA always sounds weird to me <laughs> because I've used it so many times. But Right now, what we're doing is we're taking some text and we're going to compare it to a space already built. To do that, we're going to use the coherence function. And coherence has two options. Local coherence is the cosine between two adjacent sentences. So what happens here? is it takes sentence one of your text that you want to calculate this on, it takes sentence two, it figures out where all of those words are in your um, in your space, your semantic space, and essentially looks at the, uh, I don't want to call this a correlation because it's not quite a correlation, but the idea is similar to a correlation, like how much do the rows of sentence one and the rows of sentence two match? Okay. This is technically cosine, just like um, 
mathematical cosines, the angle between the vectors, uh, which effectively works out to be a very similar measurement to correlation, where negative 1 implies that these two things never intersect. They never have the same context. They're never used in the same way. And 1 means they always appear in the con same context. They're always used the exact same way. Essentially, the, same, the sentences are the same two sentences is what would happen there. Uh, and then any number in between. 0 implies that it's sort of a mixed bag. It doesn't imply that there's, it implies that there's no relationship um, in the sense that the words sometimes appear together and sometimes don't. Okay. So local coherence is the overlap in sentence context from one sentence to the next. Global coherence is the average of all the cosines of 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, etc. Uh, oh, and we just talked about cosine is a similar to correlation. It's not calculated the same way at all, but if you have the idea of like, this is kind of like a correlation that'll help you interpret it. Okay. And let's look at how these are processed. Okay. Now, a minute ago, I was showing you sentence one. Sentence one here. This is problematic for calculating coherence because coherence is calculated on how much each sentence matches from one to the next. There's only one sentence here, so that doesn't work. So one problem um, with using essay scoring is that you need more than one sentence to do this type of essay scoring. There are other types. I could overlay um, two vec semantic spaces on top of each other. So essentially, I could take this question and build it into a space and see how much it matches the other space. Um, but that's not how this function works. Okay, okay we did all this. Um, so what I'd have to do, I essentially that uh, question, you kind of have to um, just overlay it on a perfect answer and see how much it matches the perfect answer. Okay. Um, what, I, what you can do with more than one sentence, though, in a good student's world. I'm going to take example answer five. This is the single one single answer and it was a good one. Okay. And you just so you stick in a text. Okay, it has to have multiple sentences. This is why we didn't take out punctuation because we need it for this function. And T vectors here is your space. And we're going to use Wonderland. Now these questions were about attention. Right, what is attention? It's about inhibition and this queuing task and all these other um, words. And I'm going to compare it to Alice in Wonderland. Hopefully you can understand why that shouldn't be very good. Um, and what I got was a warning here that um, elements of S found in row names for some sentence S and X. This is a really bad way to say some of the words never happen in our space. Okay. Um, so if a sentence does not overlap with the semantic space at all, you just get nothing because it is not built into the picture of the data. Okay. So there are not some of the words in my attention questions that are in Alice in Wonderland. Okay. Then when there are, the coherence between sentences as compared to Alice in Wonderland are very low. So essentially what this is telling me is if this question should have been worded like Alice in Wonderland, the student should get a zero because it doesn't cohere to that semantic space. Okay. And I do this on purpose because I think it's important to talk about why the space that you use matters. So let's pick a better space. Okay. So that cat's like chewing on everything. Okay. So I'm going to load... Uh, the English British National Corpus that's been built into a space and kind of crunched. So obviously in the British National Corpus there's way more documents. So what they have is they have a reduced space where they've taken the entire data set and sort of like smashed it in uh, using singular vector decomposition. And so now each column doesn't really represent a document, it represents a context or a theme. All right, so I'm gonna load that bad boy. I'm going to do the exact same thing, except now I'm going to do an English space. 
and you will notice that the students' answers now appear much better. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So what I'm seeing is that from sentence one to sentence two, the students, the coherence, the, the relationship between the sentences is very high. Okay, and two to three, three to four. This is about what you would expect given that they're kind of talking about a couple of different things at once. So this is not necessarily how understandable the text is. So don't think about coherence as like how, how much I can understand it. It's more of how much does each sentence map together? How much do they share the same semantic space? Are they in the same neighborhood or are they in different neighborhoods? So if I stuck a random sentence of Alice in Wonderland on the end, I should see this drop off. All right, so their global coherence was about 80. What I did for students in this class was I used this to score their answers, uh, and part of their score was based on this overlap between um, their answer and a perfect answer. It wasn't their total score because you never get perfect. You never, even in a, a situation where I think the student has probably a better answer than my own golden answer. Um, you almost never get perfect ones. So this was part of their score and then it got curved. Um, now, what I might consider is that this is their coherence in English. So this is how much they're using words that appear together but based on a giant English corpus. Does that match the scientific stuff that we're doing? Maybe, maybe not. So what I could do is instead build my own semantic space from the textbook. Okay. A word of warning here, all of these slides, when you get into this book stuff, uh, will not run. Okay. They've got eval set to false. Okay. That's on purpose because I can't give you the PDF to this book because that would that copyright valid stuff. So uh, all of this is just showing you how this works. I've actually already done it and loaded it in the background. Um, so you do have the book space, but none of the code here um, on building the space will work. But that's okay, because I have another example of building a space where the code does run, so you could do it one step at a time and look at it. So just kind of a warning when you're looking at this later, um, this particular set of slides won't run. I've already kind of done this, uh, mostly because of copyright issues. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's say you're working with PDFs, a lot of them. Uh, PDF Tools is a great library that we can use to import a bunch of them or just one. And I told it to import the textbook for this class. Okay. Then now I need to do a lot of pre-processing. I don't want punctuation, I don't want stop words, I don't want nothing. I just want the main content words in the document. So to do this, we're going to build a corpus with a capital C object in R. There are several functions, but nearly everyone's favorite is the TM library. Okay. Uh, and when I loaded PDF tools and read in the book, it reads it in as one giant vector of data. So it's like each chapter so to speak, and then give or take, each chapter um, in one column of data. So what I can do is do vector source of my book that I imported, and I just convert that into a corpus. From there, um, I'm now going to clean the text. I will tell you that you can do all of this in one swoop. You can just stick all of it into TM map. I like to run it as separate lines, mostly because I feel like it helps me understand like, okay, the first thing I'm going to do is lowercase all the words. It's lower. And then I'm going to remove all the punctuation. Okay. Then I'm going to remove all the stop words. Okay. You don't have to. You can just put this all into one function um, and just put to lower, comma, remove punctuation, comma, blah. Um, Either way, works the same. I, I like it in separate ones just because it's easier for me to read, but 
That's just personal preference. So common steps, removing our lower casing words, taking out all the punctuation because we're building a space, not calculating coherence, uh, removing English, in this case, stop words. The stop words library, which also has to be installed with TM, has other languages. So if you want to do this in a, if a different language, you can remove, uh, you can put in other words here than English. So we're kind of just pruning out a lot of the noise in the data. You can also remove numbers. Um, and there is some question over whether or not you should stem the documents. Okay. So stimming is when we um, convert words from their affixed form, like going, into their root form, like go. Okay. The problem with stimming, which you can do, some people do, if they want to reduce the space, is stimming is a very messy. Okay. So they have the snowball stimmer, which is a form of the porter stimmer, the Lancaster stimmer. I personally don't like doing these because I feel like you lose something, but you would be able to combine some words that are the same. Um, so here's an example of why we I don't tend to do them. Let's say you have the word airplane. The word wings is going to come up because airplanes have wings. A stimmer will reduce the word wings into the letter W because it will remove the S because for plurals, and then it will remove the ING for um, well, present participle tense or whatever that is. Um, so going, uh, eating. And so you're left with the letter W, which doesn't make any freaking sense, right? So um, I think a lot of people will kind of leave stimming alone if you have a big enough data set, because then you don't need to combine them. They just naturally occur in the same spaces because they're just different tenses um, or different plurals. Uh, limitization, however, is, pro is a good choice if you have the capability. Uh, it's not really that easy in R. It's doable. Um, where instead you just look it up in the dictionary, right? Went becomes go. Wings becomes a wing, singular. Um, and so I think in these sorts of models with enough data, you don't need to do either of those. You just need to clean out the, the noise. So lowercasing, punctuation, and stop words. But sometimes people ask me about stimming, and it's kind of complex. Some people do it. I don't think it hurts um, too much if the data is large. Okay. But then if the data is large, then leaving them alone also is probably fine. My small stimming rant there. All right, now we have a map. The TM map is where it's starting to represent uh, words by documents. But to complete that process, what you do is take your corpus and make it into a term document matrix. These are not as complex as they sound. This is a conditional frequency distribution of words and their frequencies in each document. I'm going to convert that to a regular matrix uh, just because otherwise this stuff doesn't run as well. <laughs> this is just a practical standpoint. <coughs> it runs faster if it's a matrix and not a TDM but this is personal preference as well. Okay. All right. Here's the problem. I have my term by document matrix. That's step one in building space. Okay. Step two is dealing with sparsity. Okay. Sparsity, remember, like it says, all the zeros in the document. So there are plenty of words that never occur in a single document, and there are, set, there are lots of words that only occur in one document. So there's lots of zeros and lots of small counts in a TDM. That's just the way language is. This is a problem with language as a whole. This is not a problem with LSA or a problem with any of these other analyses we've talked about. It's a problem with language. Our, the creativity and sheer number of words in any language allow us to have many instances where words never co-occur or they never appear together. They just There's lots of zeros. Um, to deal with that, the suggestion is to weight the matrix. Um, sometimes people will convert this to PMI, point-wise mutual information, uh, but the more popular version of weighting um, is the uh, inverse density function. 
and a log. Okay. So calculating the log of this, um, what that does is it takes this distribution that's almost a Poisson distribution, right? So heavily skewed, um, positive skewed, where there's a whole lot of zeros and then a long tail. We've gotten rid of some of the tail by excluding stop words, but they're still very frequent words. Um, and what that does is it kind of converts it more to normal, right? So creates that's why there are negatives in these spaces, is because log does create these negatives. Um, so you multiply the log of the matrix by the inverse density function. And so kind of what you end up with is a normalized matrix that has um, then weighted where uh, generally negatives imply that those words don't ever appear in those documents and um, or those context themes and positives that mean that they appear more in it. So you kind of almost end up with these correlations. They're not, they're not correlations. None of this chapter is correlations, but you get that kind of feel um, of the idea that negative means they don't ever happen. They're repelled. So use some terms we've gone over. Um, positives means they're attracted. And what that does is it allows us to control for the fact that there are some words that are very frequent and some words that are never frequent at all. all right. Next step is to run SVD. Okay. And SVD, like I said, is a, is a weight. It, it takes the weighted matrix and like crutches. In our situation, with this semantic space, oh, we can't look at this one, that's right. Um, we're not, we don't have so many chapters that we need to crunch documents. So what's gonna happen is a lot of the rows are gonna get dropped for words that are idiosyncratic, meaning they don't happen very often. Um, but not a lot of the documents. Okay, if you had a thousand, a hundred thousand documents, um, what happens is you generally kind of take the top of the matrix. Okay, so you may take the most probable words and the most probable contexts. So an LSA space that's been processed is no longer term by document, although that people still call it that. It's term by context is the best way I can think of it, because I don't want to call it topic, because that's next week, um, or the week after. Uh, so it's term by context, or theme. Okay, so it's been converted to kind of these the thematics of that document. <clears throat> and um, it will, you can take the largest factors in this decomposition. Okay? Uh, and that'll make a little bit more sense, I think, in a couple weeks when we do factor analysis. All right, and then I'm going to convert it back to a text matrix so I can do some stuff with it. Okay, so we're kind of converting it in and out of these different forms of R objects. Um, but those are just our ways to just convert it into something usable. Okay. So the LSA function actually does SVD on it, okay. which is odd. I wish LSA also had the weighting built in, but yeah, it's a different step. Okay, so ran that on my weighted matrix. I ended up with my LSA, and then I'm just going to convert that back to a text matrix. Now, whew, all that work. Uh, we'll just load that up. Okay, so this is the file that I built before doing this. Okay. And so I'm going to calculate coherence one more time, but this time on the textbook. Okay. So how much do the stu is the students writing matching the textbook from sentence to sentence? And it's not as good as um, it's better than Alice in Wonderland, which is good. So they're not writing random sentences. Um, it's not as good as just plain old English. It's somewhere in the middle. And this is what I expect. So I expect that students' answers, unless they're plagiarizing, um, would match English a little better because they're trying to talk about it a little more informally than matching a scientific textbook, which is very dry and boring. So I am, I am not surprised that the coherence has decreased from about 80 to 70 because I don't expect students to write like the textbook. Okay. And every once in a while you get a student who's really good at this, but generally they don't. Okay. Um, and so I actually used both of these for their answers. Um, 
and, and that's a general rule that when you use a, a corpus or that is very broad, like just using the English, essentially English, because BMC is just a representation of English, even though and it's both British and American English, unlike the name. Um, uh, I expect that to match better than a more specific um, space. Okay. Now, spaces like Alice in Wonderland should not match at all. Okay. And so that is 23 slides on why space choice matters. <laughs> right? So picking the comparison point is important. So you need to find the LSA space that you think matches best what you're going for. And so in this one, I think the textbook matches best on content, and then English matches best on writing style. Okay, so it's a little bit of both. Next thing we're going to try is looking at the neighbors. While LSA spaces are used for predictiveness, the more interesting things that you can do with it is make pictures. Okay. So um, the plot neighbors function allows us to take an individual word at the moment, we're going to do multiples in a second, and just see what words are related to it. Okay. So I know that this document's about attention. So if you end up doing one of these on your own, pick a word that is in your document. Don't use the word attention unless it, you expect it to be in your document, because otherwise it may not run. Okay. So if this word is not in your document set, uh, you won't, you'll get a blank picture, basically. Um, but I want to know what words are best related to the concept they're supposed to be getting. So when they wrote these essays, here's the concept they're supposed to get. What is most related to it cosine style? So I can do 10, 20, 30, you can print more, I just print to 10. The space, here I've picked book LSA, I could put, pick the English one and we get a different space. Uh, Multidimensional scale is in the usual method, you could also do principal components analysis. This just helps you graph it. Okay, you'll get slightly different answers. I feel like I see MDS more often, but there's no, I don't have a good answer for why pick one over the other. Two dimensions is usually best. Although you can do this in one, you can also do it in three. Much past that, it doesn't graph. So let's look at just the picture. It also prints out the XY coordinates. So what we've done in the past is actually saved the XY coordinates and put this in the ggplot as a scatter plot. You can also do that. So here's dimension one um, of the data. So this is like. Uh, if I took my entire space and reduced it down to two dimensions, okay, what words best hang out with attention? Okay? They're the most related across all of these contexts. Okay? And here we're reducing all of those contexts into two basically context points. So um, here, uh, this dimensionality one is like at zero, it's equally likely to be in either dimension. And then at the negative ends, these two dimensions don't happen together. This one is one happens and the other one doesn't. This is positive, both positive means they always happen together. So this allows dimensions to be correlated as well. And I mostly ignore the, the axes. Because uh, I don't find it useful necessarily to really plot and be like, okay, well this one's in the, in the negative, negative quadrant. Really it's about the space between them. So here's our word, attention, here in the middle. Okay. Uh, the most related words are the ones that are the closest to it. Okay. So pay attention, not too surprising, that's a collocate. Uh, it's part of the definition of attention. So um, I'm not surprised that this word comes up in these documents. In a um, in the English language document, this maybe shouldn't happen quite as much. Okay. Um, and so, I'm sorry, just a quick explanation. This is based on the book, not the students' answers. Okay, so based on the book, what are the words the students should be saying? Labeling of attention, setting and settings. So this is where people usually ask me about um, limitization. 
but you'll see that we didn't limitize this. We didn't do any uh, word fixing. We left them as, as they are, and you'll see that they come up together. So this is why I don't think necessarily that it's that useful, because they do do what you expect. They show up together. Okay. Uh, Woodward over here is a uh, person in that chapter they talk about a lot. Joint attention is really common. And then uh, I can't remember what all these words are. Okay. Uh, let's see if we can see what they are. Yeah, okay. Let's hit that button. Excellent. Coherence. Excellent. Give me the picture. All right. Whoop. Um, 1992B. <laughs> so one issue is by leaving in numbers. Uh, what I've got here is the Woodward and Hall 1992B. <laughs> so I've got the citation that appears many times in the document. We have labeling, um, this other word, settings, what's the other one? Enabling. Okay. Which is not, also not surprising given the book. If I want to know what words are the most related in a document or this actually, this function is more useful if you are trying to pick words that have a specific relationship. So um, what people often do in my line of work is they are trying to create experiments with specific uh, relationships. So I want words that are unrelated. So I want their cosine value to be zero. Or I want words that are really related. So I want their cosine to be like 0.6 or 0.8. And what this will do is, given a space, so maybe English, I could um, pick a concept and find the, rela uh, the relationship of the words, uh, find words that have that strength of relationship. Sorry, I got a little muddled there. So let's say I want to pick the word information, because that's a word that appears a lot in this section. And I want words that are sort of related to information. I would call this a medium relationship, much like a correlation. And just give me 10 random words that are between 0.3 and 0.4. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is that you can, if you have read this textbook, <laughs> you can see the different chapters start to pop up. So uh, the evaluation of information, this is going to be our problem-solving, decision-making chapter. Information flow is the chapters where it talks about working memory. Uh, information loss is the chapters about forgetting. So um, what I can kind of see here is that it's picking a random set in the sort of medium relationship. And they have a medium relationship because information in a cognitive textbook is going to be related to a lot of different things. I could go higher. So let's see, let's go. There's usually an upper limit. Let's try 0.6 to 0.9 so we get a couple words. Okay. So the information, the word information in this data set, its strongest relationship is between one and can. Okay. And these are not very interesting words. So I could back down a little bit and get words that are in, still in the top. Okay. Information processing is something that they probably have in every chapter. Okay. Um, but a lot of these two are words I wouldn't care about. Like also, okay, word knowledge, that's a good one. But This would allow me to build an experiment or um, a set of words that are sort of loosely related. So this might be really good for um, keyword optimization. All right, last task. What we're going to do is now build a corpus or a LSA space out of their answers. Before, I hadn't done this because I had been using that answer set and comparing it to a space. Now, I'm going to build a space out of their answers. Okay, so this is the full gamut of different things you can do. Um, I'm going to use TM again, and I'm just, I've, um, I've got all the steps here that you can use. I just kind of crammed it all a little bit into one slide. Uh, we built the corpus from our vector source. We lowercased it, removed punctuation, and removed stop words. 
here's how you would stim it if you wanted to. So if you thought stimming would make your answer a little bit more mean, useful and meaningful, you could do that, and this is how. I uh, converted it to a term by document matrix. I weighted the matrix okay, by log an inverse density function. I ran singular vector decomposition on it, converted it back. If you want to save this, because if you have a lot of documents, this can be very slow. Just a warning. Um, R is a beautiful statistical language, but is not necessarily meant for ginormous amounts of data. Uh, most of the things that we're doing have been small enough data sets, but let's say you managed to get to calculate something, um, you could save it. This is how. Now, we saw in our picture earlier what attention was related to in the book. What are the students, blah, 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 what do the students think attention is related to? So now all I've done here is change this out. It's the exact same function. Um, and I could compare the neighborhoods of these different spaces. So now I've got the book space, the golden answer, the right answer, and the student space. How are they different? And they are way different. Look at this. Here's attention. Now we've got blindness, change. So change blindness is when you don't notice that something has changed in your visual field. Focusing, describe, because they're describing answers. We get information. Uh, paradigm is queuing paradigm. And that's because I asked them to tell me about the queuing paradigm, which is this experiment run um, that we talked about in class. And so these are more what I would expect given the, the question that I asked them to answer, um, which clearly is pretty different from the book. Um, so kind of like what else is going on? So how else might I explore what's in this corpus? You can actually look at the relationship of a set of words instead of one word. So you would need to pick a set of words that you were interested in, kind of um, like maybe a cluster that you thought would be interesting. So you could also take results from a previous analysis that we've done and then examine them on a space. So a lot of these analyses kind of can be complementary. And then we can plot them and calculate their relationships. So let's do that. So I'm going to pick a couple of words here. Um, in the student answers, I expect them to talk about objects because attention is the ability to focus on some objects and not others. Uh, insignificant because it's a funny word that people use when they say that some, something in a visual field is not important. Uh, most of them have just taken stats, so they call things insignificant when they're um, ignored in a visual field. Attention. And then endogenous attention is controlled attention. This is when you're focusing on something. Exogenous attention is when there's a loud noise and you're like, oh, what just happened? Okay. <clears throat> and instead of plot neighbors, it's plot word list. Okay. Otherwise, it looks exactly the same. I'm using the exam answers here and not the book. Let's look at that picture. And I can kind of tell, this would be even better with more words, but here are four that work. Um, I can kind of tell that endogenous, endogenous attention go together and insignificant object go together. Okay. Uh, and there's a clear distinction of when they occur and when they don't occur. Okay. So these two are kind of collocates, and these two are kind of collocates, and they're kind of repelling from each other. Okay. Um, and so this is another way to kind of see that same analysis that we did for DCA, but through LSA. What is that relationship, though? Because, I mean, it's like pretty clear they look like they're separate items here, separate pairs. But let's calculate the cosine between them. Okay, so the function is multi-cos for multi-cosine instead of just COS for cosine. Or, oh, LSA, it's cosine spelled out. COS will give you um, literal mathematical cosine. Okay. So you stick in the list and your space here. Uh, obviously, there's ones down the center because it's related to itself with a one. But insignificant object is really high. 
Students use those two together a lot. Now this is a bag of words approach, so that does not mean that they're saying insignificant object. It is what they're saying, but as long as they're in the same document, this would be considered a high relationship. Object-based attention is pretty is higher than you expect given the picture. Object and endogenous are a little higher, but so that's why object is pulled towards these two. Okay. So they're still pretty occurring together in a pretty regular way. But insignificant is not appearing with endogenous and attention. These would be low, small relationships. Okay. So a cosine here helps me quantify what's really happening in this picture. These two are really related, these two are really related. Object and these three are kind of related, but insignificant, not with the rest. Now when you're creating these pictures, if you have one word that's off on Mars, I usually suggest try taking it out so you can see what the other words are. Because sometimes when you, people create these pictures, they get like six words all on top of each other, and one word way out here in space. Uh, take that word out so you can zoom in on the words that are related. A quick summary and then any questions you guys have. Um, we started by talking about building a space that matches what you're trying to map onto. Uh, so we can take text in its mostly raw form and use coherence to help score documents, for example. Okay. How much does document one match document two? Other thing you can do with this is, um, that some people do, is use it as a way to um, Mean part. Um, classify documents. So documents that have a high coherence to a known set of topics. Topics models will be better for this, but that's next week. So let's say you have a, a set of documents that you know are about um, mechanics, and then a set of documents that you know are about knitting, for example, to have two very different things. Um, so you get a new document. Which one should it go into? You can use co uh, coherence onto a space to determine which one it should go into. Okay. Um, uh, the, the space that you put in heavily influences these scores. Uh, neighborhoods can then be examined to understand themes and words that are related together in a thematic set. Okay. Uh, you can calculate cosine values on individual words and that could actually be useful in other studies um, for, an F, for language processing like priming. And really the goal of building these models is to explore, right? figure out what is happening. Well, I'm going to take all this text and I'm going to reduce it down into something that I can explore rather than having, you know, thousands and thousands of words that I don't, that I would have to read. Right? And so this can really be used to predict future information. And the next week, what, well, not next week, but the week after, um, there's going to be a video on topics models. So kind of a contrast to uh, SVD is using uh, latent derelict analysis, or LDA, to create a, a set of topics rather than a set of contexts. And we'll get into those comparison points in that lecture. So in short, I love LSA. This stuff is so cool because it, to me it really helps build a, a, a model of the data. And I don't mean like statistical model. I mean like here's how all these things appear to be related. Now let's look and see. I'm interested in X. Let's see what else is related to it. Okay, so uh, very similar to our idea of networks. Uh, network the network models we did in the executive session have a similar feel to this kind of thing. You're building cosines between them, and that kind of picture could be graphed from an LSA result as well. Um, so we could use LSA as a way to make a network model picture.